every time we come to the gift of the Mass, there are countless graces that God is pouring out on our lives. A lot of times he knows that we need a grace in a certain area of our lives. Maybe we've been down and out about a certain situation and the Lord wants to just breathe a word of encouragement on your heart in that area. Personal graces, like I always think of the Eucharist as the meal that heals. And God knows how to season it with what you need for this day. Just like someone who loves you cooking something for you and they know you like more spice or you like less spice. That God's grace is always particular for your soul. He knows what you need. Would you just look at somebody near you and mumble under your mask? He knows what you need. He knows what you need. So he is going to be feeding your heart with what you need, I believe. And then also there's a corporal grace at times, a, a movement in the liturgy that there's something that I, in the liturgy that God is offering everybody. And that usually in the scriptures, something we go after. And today, the heart of St. Paul and the freedom of being consumed in the love of God is a particular grace, I think, being offered for everybody. The heart of St. Paul and the freedom that comes with being consumed in the love of God. The words we heard from the second reading from the letter to the Philippians are from the first chapter. And these words that we hear are remarkable because Paul is writing them from prison. He's written several of his letters from prison. In one of his letters, he says, remember my chains. I am a prisoner for Christ, literally in prison. The Philippians, the community of Philippi, was in Eastern Europe, ancient Macedonia, and in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, we hear that on one of Paul's missionary journeys, he went through Philippi. It was a Roman colony filled with ex-Roman soldiers. So it was very much a Roman-flavored society. And Paul came proclaiming Christ the King, which is an issue if Caesar is king. And Paul was greatly persecuted for it. And so were those who believed this early Christian community in Philippi. They were persecuted greatly, and yet they stayed faithful to Jesus. So they sent one of their people from their community to Paul in jail, and they brought him a gift to where he was imprisoned in Rome, they say most likely. And the letter to the Philippians is Paul sending a letter back. He says, thank you for the gift. And then he gives them an update on a few things. He tells them, I want you to know, brothers, that my situation has turned out rather to advance the gospel so that my imprisonment has become well known in Christ throughout the whole praetorium and to all the rest. Imagine that. You send the gift to the guy in jail and he sends it back and he says, things are going great. The mission's still unfolding. The gospel's still being proclaimed. I love that. I want you to know, my brothers, that my situation has turned out rather to advance the gospel. And he tells them, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's writing to this community that has said yes to Jesus and he has a heart for them. And he wants them to know what God has started in you, your journey of faith. He's gonna bring it to completion. Yes, I know you have problems there. I have problems here. As one scholar said, being in a Roman prison was no picnic. But he says, God's gonna bring it to completion this faith that you have in Jesus that is leading you through every difficulty and challenge. And then Paul says, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, life is Christ and death is gain. Pause. Paul is close to martyrdom. It wouldn't be far from the time he wrote this letter until he was executed by the Roman government, martyred. At this time, he knows that's on the table. That's a possibility. It's coming, imprisoned in Rome. And yet he's also thinking that perhaps he could get released 
But even if he's not released, he's still on the mission, sending these letters. And so he says from his prison cell, for me, life is Christ and death is gain. If I go on living in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I shall choose. I am caught between the two. I long to depart this life and be with Christ, for that is far better. Yet that I remain in the flesh is more necessary for your benefit. So he's in prison. He knows the end might be near. And he actually says, I don't know which one I'm going to choose. The choice would be made when they made the decision that his life would end in this life. But Paul said, it's far better to be with Christ. I long to depart this life and be with Christ, for that is far better. He's been through a lot, shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, everything. At this point in his life, Paul's saying, I'll take it. I'll take heaven. I'll take the reward of eternal life with Jesus. But if I stay, if I stay, it's fruitful labor. For to me, and then he, it's the sum, summation line. For to me, life is Christ and death is gain. If I'm living, every breath is for Christ. If I die, it's, it's going to be a gain because I've lived for him and the eternal reward of living for him is heaven, to be with him forever. For to me, life is Christ. Now, let's go there to that place. Paul is in prison. He's imprisoned. And he's able to say in just a few chapters, a few lines later, he says, a few chapters later, rejoice always. I shall say it again. Rejoice. The Lord is near. I mean, have you maybe in the last several months had a change in your life that was slightly uncomfortable? <laughs> This guy is in prison, and he's able to say, Rejoice, rejoice always. I say it again, rejoice. The Lord is near. And he says, For to me, life is Christ, and death is gain. The heart of Paul that is free in God's presence as he's consumed with the love of Jesus is what is on the table for us. The heart of Paul, free in God's presence, consumed with love of Jesus, is right in front of us. It's for us to say yes to. And every moment, everything we do, to do it with Jesus, walking right with you, to know that your heartbeat beats with his. Every beat of his heart, every beat of your heart, Christ lives in you through the Holy Spirit and your faith in Jesus. When the Pope talked a few years ago about being a joyful missionary disciple, he described the church as a band of joyful missionary disciples. I don't think you can find a more joyful missionary disciple than the guy who's in prison for Jesus and he says, Rejoice! Rejoice always! I say it again, the Lord is near! And he's still evangelizing from his prison cell. So when we look at the life of Paul, we can see in the local church here in Detroit, we have a phrase called encounter, grow, and witness. That's a beautiful cycle for the life of a disciple of Jesus, that we continue to encounter Jesus, we continue to grow in our relationship with Jesus, we celebrate that on Catechetical, Catechetical Sunday, and we continue to witness to Jesus. All three of these components really lead to a healthy life of discipleship. And that is life, man. That is living, being filled with the Lord. So let's look at three passages of Paul and we come down the home stretch here. First, encounter. And this all goes back to the heart of Paul, which is a grace for each of us to be free in God's presence, consumed with the love of Jesus. You want to say that with me? Free in God's presence, consumed with the love of Jesus. I heard you, Sally. You want to say it once more? Free in God's presence, full of the love of Jesus. All right. Regardless of circumstances, free in God's presence, full of the love of Jesus. Encounter, grow, and witness. First, encounter. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul writes this. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, 
That's prayer. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. All of us gazing with unveiled face on the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the image, from, into the same image, from glory to glory, as from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Quite literally, when we turn to the Lord, that's prayer, when we pray, Paul describes a veil being lifted. Whatever it is that may be blocking our consciousness of God, even if it's just our lack of attention or awareness of God's presence, that veil is lifted. And we are blessed to gaze upon the presence of God with the eyes of the heart, the eyes of faith. And gazing upon the presence of God, which that word also in the scriptures is face. Face means presence, presence means face. We turn to the Lord. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is lifted. And all of us, gazing with unveiled face on the glory of the Lord, get this, are being transformed from glory to glory into the same image. What you gaze on, the beautiful presence of God in prayer, you are being transformed, conformed to and transformed by when we turn in prayer to the Lord and encounter God's presence, we are becoming more conformed to God's presence. We are made in the image and likeness of God, and when we pray and turn to God, encounter God, we become more full of the love of God, that heart that's free in God's presence, full of the love of Jesus. Prayer is the foundation of the spiritual life, encountering God. It's what allows us, like Paul, in any circumstance to say rejoice. Rejoice always. I say it again. Rejoice. The Lord is near. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Yeah? And then grow. Grow. When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Every word of God is, in, you know, like the scriptures, every word of God, it's inspired and is useful for teaching, refutation, correction, training. We continue to study the word, to read the word, to study it. We continue to study the faith which breaks open the word. And we're growing as we continue to study, to prayerfully read and to study and those words about refutation, correction, we've all got thoughts and sometimes dispositions that the Word of God corrects and changes. An idea that needs to be rooted out and the Word of God gives us the thoughts we need to see the thing differently so that idea that wasn't of the Lord can be refuted or corrected. Paul always chewing on the Word of God with his past as a Pharisee, certainly knowing the Old Testament and then becoming an author of a lot of the New Testament. So growing through continued prayerful reading of Scripture and study of the faith. And the final one, witness. Encounter, grow, witness. How do we have a heart that's free in the presence of God, filled with the love of Jesus? We keep encountering the Lord. We keep growing by studying that Word and studying the faith. And it's not healthy for a disciple of Jesus to stay bottled up in the faith. It's not healthy to not have an appetite or to suppress the appetite to shine the light of Jesus. Who in here has bad eyesight? Like, you really need your glasses. Okay, if you, if you had your glasses off and if you had your glasses off and there was a candle lit in the room about, oh, six, seven feet away and the room was dark, could you see the light? You could tell there's a light, but you couldn't distinguish very clearly the, the candle flame, right? Okay, all around us in this world, brothers and sisters, there's people that can't see right now that Jesus is the Lord and loves them and changes the way we think and live, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But you are light. 
Jesus said you're the light of the world, and this is about witnessing. And sometimes they can't see a candle flame, but even if they have bad sight, they can tell there's light. They can tell there's light. And you are the light of the world. And being willing to witness to Jesus, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, final scripture, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation for those who believe. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation. So making the decision that I'm going to talk about Jesus. And I probably have done it 17 times. I'll probably do it a thousand before I go home to the Lord. The quickest, easiest way I know to get into an evangelization situation is just ask somebody when you're leaving a store or something, hey, I love to pray. Is there anything I can pray for you? That's so simple. And when they say what it is, and if there's no line, get into a conversation. Can I pray right now? And I'm going to pray in the name of Jesus. Is that okay? You just get his name out there. The key is love. Loving in your countenance, loving in the way that you speak, loving in the way you say the name of Jesus. We have to take risks to witness to Jesus, to put ourselves in a spot where we feel a little uncomfortable. And remember, fruit grows at the edge of a branch. you got to step out on a limb. Witness. And you don't have to be an expert. We just have to love Jesus and know that he wants to touch people's lives around us. And the more we do it, the more you're going to have those encounters where the lady at Starbucks starts crying and you had no idea. She was just waiting for somebody to tell her God loves her and to say the name of Jesus. So witness to be willing to step out unashamed of the gospel. But if we don't have love when we do it, better to stay quiet because Paul said we're a noisy gong without love. So friends, the holy homework this week, if you would like to have your heart free in the presence of God, full of the love of Jesus, like St. Paul who could say from a prison cell, it's working out. And for me, life is Christ. For to me, life is Christ. Every moment, the whole of the Christian life is a living expression of faith in Jesus. The whole thing. Whether you're at the grocery store, whatever you're doing, the whole of the Christian life is an expression of faith in Jesus. And we can say, for to me, life is Christ. So the holy homework, take the letter to the Philippians. It's only four chapters. Sit with it. Ask St. Paul to help you. Read the scriptures. And ask for that grace, that uh, what's flowing off of St. Paul. Ask for that grace that you would be, your heart would be free in the presence of God, full of the love of Jesus. Prayerfully read Philippians chapter 4 this week and ask for the grace that your heart would be free in the presence of God, full of the love of Jesus. I pray none of us are in a jail cell this week, but all of us, face a different thoughts that come at us that threaten to enclose us in ourselves, to be discouraged, to be down and out. And we can say, no, my heart's free in the presence of God, full of the love of Jesus. And for to me, life is Christ. For to me, life is Christ. In every single moment, would you say it with me once? For to me, life is Christ. This grace is yours. Thank you, Jesus.